please give a warm welcome to Mr. Sal Trico. Good afternoon. On behalf of uh, Port of Plaquemines and American Patriot Holdings, I'd like to welcome everybody to this lunch. I um, have two options, option A or option B, and I decided to start off with option B thanks to Dennis. You were trying to get everybody fired up here. So indulge me. I'm going to start off with a little bit of levity, which has a message. Sherlock Holmes and Watson go on a camping trip. They set up a tent, fall asleep. Several hours later, Holmes wakes up his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the skies and tell me what you see. Watson replies, I see a million stars. Holmes asks, what does that tell you? Watson ponders for a minute. Astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of gal galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Time-wise, it appears to be a quarter past three. Theologically, it is evident the Lord is all-powerful and we are small and insignificant. Watson then asks, Holmes, what does it tell you? Holmes, silent for a moment, and speaks, Watson, you idiot, someone stole our tent. <laughs> the message, we're embarking on exciting times. We need to remain focused, eyes on the horizon. Opportunity must be harnessed and earned. It's not going to fall in our lap. We need to keep an eye on the tent, too. We got some exciting things to talk about. I'm going to talk about global trade and inland waterways. Global maritime trade will double by the year 2030. Three main drivers, global population growth, global GDP growth, influenced by Asia, and 40% energy demand growth. This will uh, double seaborne trade, and trade growth will grow from t 10 billion to 20 billion tons. That is significant. That's a big impact. How does that impact the container market, the container port market demand? If you look at the container market demand, uh, between uh, 1990 and 2008, there was a 10% compounded annual growth rate. The real focus here is between 2010 and 2025. Astronomical projected growth rate. Astronomical. That is an opportunity. How, how are we going to focus on that? How does it impact the Midwest? Is the Midwest included? And the answer is yes. Historical trade patterns, pre-Panama Canal. Gulf Coast represented 6.4% of the container volume. Midwest represented 40% uh, of the contiguous ma uh, land mass, 15% of GDP, 92% uh, of agricultural goods, 60% of grain exports, and approximately 200 million metric tons of export. That's a significant player. Midwest is a significant player. Can it improve? Can it optimize on that? Yesterday, Mike Steenhook for the Soy Transportation Coalition talked about the next 10 years. Exponential growth. Soy, corn, wheat. Exponential growth. Is that going to impact the Midwest? Absolutely. Some of that needs to be containerized. Non-GMO, chain of custody. So the answer is opportunity. Recent shifts, ocean carriers. They're consolidating. Now there's three major alliances. Less vessels, but bigger vessels. They're pooling their assets and they're pooling their slots. Pooling slots is basically filling all the slots on the vessel. Southwest, all the seats are full. Same concept. Uh, Gulf Coast ports are inherent, have some inherent inefficiencies. They were built for uh, five to 8,000 TEU vessels. They're getting bigger now. Uh, Limited capability for expansion. That affects and results in dwell time, dwell delays. Dwell delays are time sitting on the time. It affects your logistics. The more you sit on the time, the more it impacts delays and it costs money. Uh, and intermodal delays, the two of those together affects time and dollars. 
Larger vessels are causing, causing greater congestions on the West Coast. Bigger vessels takes longer to load and offload. Labor issues are compounding that as well. That's not going to change. That's not going to go away. Uh, that adds to the extra delivery time, and it impacts the Midwest as well. Uh, companies are moving to the Midwest. New manufacturing creates new opportunities for distribution fulfillment centers, importing parts and, uh, parts and equipment. Is that an opportunity? Absolutely. Post-Panama Canal. Before the Panama Canal, the maximum TEU vessel was 5,000 TEU. It's now 15,000. Starting June 1st, it'll be 18,000 TEU, up to 18,000. It, it'll go by design. Is that good news for this region? Absolutely. Bigger vessels, scales of economy. They're widening the beam restriction from 49 meters to 51.25. More tools to work with. Panama Canal, uh, excuse me, Suez Canal, two lanes now. They're going from 23 vessels capability to 97 vessels a day. Significant difference. Can that impact the, the, uh, the Gulf? Absolutely. More, more opportunity for traffic. Larger vessels have inherent efficiencies. Slot, slot savings could be 25% or greater. It's additional sa uh, sailing time. The deviation to go through the Panama Canal is longer. It takes longer to go through the Panama Canal, but that's offset because of the dwell times and, uh, or, or I should say neutralized between the uh, dwell times and the labor issues that are going on in the West Coast today. That's been validated by two major ocean carriers. Right now, the market share for the Gulf Coast rose from 9.5 to 11.9. That's without major big vessels or any optimization efficiencies. Just imagine if we could optimize larger vessels and create better efficiencies, what that number could grow to. Again, this just illustrates what the Suez Canal is doing uh, and they're planning on expanding even further. That's significant growth from 23 to 97 vessels. Let's look at 50 years of growth in the container, container vessel size. 1968, 1,500 TEUs. It's just continued to migrate. 14, 8, 15,000 is what the Panama Canal was. They call that a Neo-Panamax. Now it's going up to, up to 18,000. They're putting new order constructions in for 20,000 TEU vessels, probably cap out at 22 to 24,000 TEU vessels that can't go through the canal, and they're gonna call those mega vessels. Significant scales of economy, carry more critical mass, bring that unit cost down. That's the name of the game. Where are these big ships gonna go in the Gulf? 15, 18, 20,000 tonners, where are they going to go in the Gulf? They can't go anywhere in the Gulf right now. It's not deep enough. You can't get them deep enough. Houston can't dredge. What a Plaquemines can accommodate 20,000 plus. Preparing for the future, the Port of Plaquemines APH solution, strategically located, deepest, widest part of the river, 50% less transit time, less marine traffic. From an ocean carrier perspective, perspective, big savings. The terminal will be state-of-the-art, can accommodate 20,000 TEU vessels. State-of-the-art technology with expedites car, uh, container throughput. Combined benefits, lowest landed costs. Improved serviceability, environmentally friendly and operationally safe. Our development partnership Back in March of 2017, we jointly announced that we were going to do a gateway terminal. A gateway state-of-the-art regional terminal is regional and fully intermodal. It has to be rail, truck, air, and marine. So that's a true gateway terminal. Domestic transportation will be provided exclusively by APH on the inland marine side. And on a vessel design, I want to make this distinction we had our conceptual vessel design, now we've gone through our model testing, which now says we're ready to go to finish our engineering and then go to construction. We went to Potsdam, Germany last year, last October, and we took our design criteria and went through open water, shallow water, 
and model basin. And what's important, Potsdam is one of the best places in the world to do model testing. The model itself was 28 feet by six and a half by two and a half tons. You can go on our website and see some of the video of that testing. We're very proud of those results because we've met, met and exceeded in most cases all of the criteria, especially speed, fuel, and operational capability. So this vessel is gonna do what we say it's gonna do. Pre-feasibility study. We know we're gonna build a state-of-the-art terminal at Plaquemines. We know we're gonna build state-of-the-art innovative vessels. Now we have to make sure that we're commercially viable and is the cargo gonna be there to support the project. So we basically commissioned the report to determine the economic, economic competitiveness to serve the Midwest against the West Coast, East Coast, and Gulf Coast. The study evaluated container imports and exports uh, joining all the states on the Mississippi River, looked at landed cost from Shanghai uh, and Rotterdam to Memphis, St. Louis, and Chicago, and looked at landed costs from Plaquemines Parish uh, to ports via rail, truck, and using APH. And the results, significant transportation savings. In fact, I have to say it a second time, significant transportation savings. Uh, shippers are gonna welcome a reliable alternative. They need a reliable alternative. The project offers value proposition to uh, investors, ocean carriers, the shippers, terminal operators. And lastly, there was, uh, it, what it also supported was there was enough incremental cargo to support this project. Well, and this is not cargo that they're projecting 10 years from now. This is incremental cargo today that exists beyond what's being moved today. So that's also very important to know that there is cargo that can tie into this project. The other thing about this that's unique, this will be the first time we can take a dedicated container on vessel and tie it to an ocean dedicated liner vessel. So this is the first time we can bridge that and offer this service to shippers. So this is unique. And I think it's gonna be welcomed. And when they look at the, the, uh, the cost competitive, no, competitiveness of it, it will be a welcome change. I wanna talk about the Midwest battleground. What this chart represents is everybody's getting ready for the feast. All, the, all this new cargo's coming. So all the East Coast ports, Gulf Coast ports, and some of the, some of the Gulf are trying to get ready. So they're investing money to try to do dredging, operational efficiencies. East Coast and West Coast are kind of basically charcoal block because they still have to use intermodal. They're basically, they're gonna to have to turn around and still use rail and truck to come to the Midwest. The competitive advantage is gonna be Plaquemines. They're already naturally gonna have a port that can handle a 20,000 TEU vessel. As long as it's connected with a verti vertically integrated transportation solution that can handle critical mass at a very low landed cost. That's the secret here. And in order to do that, you have to have a port, a state-of-the-art port in the south and state-of-the-art ports in the northern regions, especially up here, and a, and a transportation solution that can move critical mass. This chart has been around for a while. The blue line, let's see if I can do this. Here it is. This blue line here represents pre-Panama Canal expansion, the serviceability from east coast and west coast. Basically, vessels from the East Coast could service up to this line, and from the West Coast, I hope everybody can see it from this side, from the West Coast would service up to this imaginary line. And when the Panama Canal expanded, it moved this imaginary line out 500 miles. It put the Midwest in what we call the sweet spot or the battleground. And we already know what the Midwest offers. What's missing, has been now these large vessels will have the capability to come in here as long as we can tie it into a viable transportation solution that could feed these big vessels. So this model has created, uh, the, or I should say the expansion has created the opportunity, we have to grab it. Port of Plaquemines is strategically located. As I already said, it's half the distance, a lot of cost savings, less dense population, it's got connect, it will have connectivity. Give you a better illustration of what it's gonna look like. 
It's going to be an intermodal con uh, container transfer facility capable of up to three 20,000-plus 20, uh, 20, TEU vessels, a dedicated berth for APH vessels, a warehouse distribution logistics center. This is state-of-the-art gateway terminal. Container on barge. Container on barge is operating today. It will continue to operate on a niche fashion. We believe it's, it, can move, it moves small-scale small scale cargo. It's slower, and that's just that way by nature. What I think I've already been trying to say container on vessel has to move critical mass to be able to handle these big vessels. What we believe container on barge is going to continue to be able to do is be complementary to this feeder service and continue to move pockets of cargo and outlying ports and continue to utilize the, uh, the feeder system. So we're, we believe the container on barge will be able to complement the feeder system. This is our strategic footprint. Our strategic footprint is by design. We have two types of vessels. Our container on vessels are one is a dedicated liner vessel and one is a hybrid. The dedicated liner vessel is exactly what it is on time scheduled service. We're trying to take the operational risk out of it by staying south of the locks and low-lying bridges. So that this vessel is the workhorse. It will move from Port of Plaquemines to Memphis on a seven-day round trip. And then the other port will be in the Port of Plaquemines to St. Louis, just south of downtown. And the spot that we've located right now is over at Jefferson County our good friends at Herculaneum. And we think that that's an ideal location for this upriver dedicated liner vessel. Again, the dedicated liner vessel is on time scheduled service, critical mass, move a lot of cargo down to Plaquemines. These vessels are not gonna wait on cargo. Our hybrid vessel will have all the efficiencies of the liner vessel a little smaller, a little bit more nimble, a lower profile to, to negotiate some of the high water clearance issues with bridges. But its job is to go through all the tributary rivers and be able to handle the also complement feeder services. Elements for success. The gift that we all have is the Mississippi River and all the tributary rivers. How do we further enhance utilization of it and connect it so that we can continue to provide the best service possible at the lowest landed cost. And we're gonna need that to feed these big vessels. So in our plan design, in our design for our vessels and the terminals, we, would, we define six elements of success to make sure that we are successful. And those elements are reliability, cost efficiency, speed, cargo payload, safety and environmentally friendly, and cargo flexibility absolutely essential to provide great service, to be a safe operation, and to do, to do the job correctly. This is our vessel. This is the dedicated liner vessel, container on vessel. As you can see, this is our pilot house forward, unobstructed view. This is our uh, patented zero wake bow design. It optimizes our upriver speeds of 13 miles an hour and zero wake bow design, which really helps environmentally with any bank erosion. This blue here is our patented echo, echo hull skull, uh, skeleton hull design. Basically reduces our light ship weight, allows us to increase our payload on a nine foot draft. And these white tanks aft are our LNG tanks. At a closer look, this is the liner vessel. Our Length is 595 and our beam is 134. I kind of go through quickly, I won't bore you with this, but height above water is 48. This vessel goes 13 miles an hour versus conventional 44 to five miles an hour upriver. Operating draft will be nine feet, but we can go up to 10. This can carry anywhere from 12.7, uh, 12 almost 15,000 long tons. Uh, it can carry up to 2,500 TEU containers. We can carry a diverse cargo mix, included refrigerated containers, reefer boxes, 500 or more, depending on what the customer needs are. Crew, we expect 10 to 12. Trading range is the Mississippi River. 
We can make three round trips before we have to fuel. I'll go to the next one. This is our, whoops, our liner vessel. Essentially the same vessel, same length, except it's 100 feet instead of 134, same speed, carries 1,800 TEU, up to 1,800 TEU instead of 2,500 TEU. It also can carry refrigerated cargo. Its trading routes are all of the tributary rivers, but also capable of going to Plaquemines Parish as well. Just some, some other competitive advantages. I've mentioned most of them are echo, skull, uh, echo skeleton skull uh, hull design, our uh, minimum bow uh, resistance, but this thing can, doesn't need any assist tugs. It can park itself. It can turn its own radius. It's got, uh, we're going to have uh, on, uh, a dynamic positioning system on this thing, and it's got redundancy in the engine room. Now we get to partnering with the Midwest. This is where some, there's some good fun happening here. Uh, with St. Louis, we have signed an MOU with Jefferson County, and we signed an MOU, I think Mary mentioned it early, with the regional freightway. We're very excited about that. I'll talk a little bit more about some of the initiatives we're doing together as far as joint marketing um, um, initiatives that we have. We signed an MOU with Kansas City. Kansas City has bought a 400-acre uh, plot to put a container terminal in. We're working closely with them on joint marketing initiatives. Memphis, we have an MOU signed with Memphis. Uh, they have a terminal location uh, already selected, and we're working jointly with them on joint marketing initiatives. Little Rock, we're signing an um, MOU with them next month. They already have a terminal location designated, and we are working closely on joint marketing efforts with them as well. Objectives for upriver ports. They have to be strategically located, have to be intermodal. There has to be symmetry between the south, between Plaquemines and up here. Not the same footprint because they're obviously not doing big vessels, but intermodal, and they have to have uh, potentially consolidation opportunities. St. Louis is an absolutely great location for potentially consolidation, taking bulk cargo and moving it into containerization for packaging. Repositioning of empties is very, very critical for us. It's going to have to be in our DNA. And I skipped one, and that's partnering with the Ag Study. There's an Ag Study going on right now that encompasses 13 states. Repositioning empty containers for farmers so that they can load them, we can pick them back up and have onward move, movement of cargo, put them on the ocean-going vessels so they can go over to Asia. It's a big study, very important, and I think will help align our vertically integrated transportation system. Project next steps, finalize our terminal equity partners, select a terminal operator. We have to finalize upriver terminal design criteria. There will be a lot of symmetry, but there will be some differences. Complete our ag study. That'll be end of June, early July. That's a very important study because it'll help strategic locations of where some of these docks and terminals should be. Uh, achieve LOIs with ocean carriers, BCOs, and investors. Work upriver ports uh, to identify future uh, demands. That's the marketing initiatives to continue looking at where this demand and, and, and cargo is going to come from. Uh, we're working with the port of Cairo. Cairo has a, uh, an interest in looking at putting a, a container terminal in. They want to sign an MOU with us. We're looking at potentially doing that next month. We're going to fi uh, finalize our designs on the liner vessel and the hybrid. We're still tweaking because we're waiting to look at what cargo size is going to be. It's very minor tweaking. Obtain shipyard construction bids. We've been talking to shipyards for about a year. And lastly, execute the project. Why the St. Louis region? Well, first of all, there's great leadership here and commitment in this region. Fantastic leadership. This is, I, I, honestly, <laughs> this is a world-class multimodal freight network, without a doubt, and it can continue to build on. And I think that's the foundation that you all are working on, and it's going to continue to grow. Freight volumes. This is a high impact area. We have to focus on marketing efforts to educate shippers and carriers. We have to show them where there's added value and benefits. 
And we're going to work on that and continue to work on that. And there's going to be meetings in the next couple of months. Our ability to consolidate freight, and that's that onward movement of taking bulk into containers. And, and basically, that could lead to warehousing, distribution centers, and potentially refrigerated cargoes. And then lastly, consolidation of freight as far as manufacturing. Manufacturing can lead to relocation and synergies. That's a big move, and that, we, there's a couple of regions that have some opportunities of looking at relocations because they want to get closer to the transportation, uh, their transportation mode. This could be an opportunity to do that. So we, there's a three-prong approach here, and the foundation's already laid out. So we're going to continue to work on the joint marketing initiatives, and I just want everybody to know that there is a hardworking group here that works every day to make this happen, and we're very proud to be part of that. I want to thank everybody for your time today, and that's all I have. Thank you.